that work? <coughs> okay, so a couple days ago I had the honor of being the keynote speaker at the North American Infrastructure Mining and Corrosion Conference where they were interested in composites and digital technology. And so what I thought, it, it got me thinking about a chronology of digital tools and digital topics. And so when I pulled the lecture together for tonight, I used a little bit that template of the history of digital tools. Um, I don't really think it's a linear history at all, but I'll present it that way. Um, but but I, I thought it would be of interest. <clears throat> So what I also have been doing is the last year I've been consulting to the Canadian Center for Architecture on a project called Archaeology of the Digital. And the CCA has decided to start a digital architecture archive where they save the actual digital files related to design projects and keep those digital files in the collection for scholars. And they're trying to figure out how to exhibit uh, digital material in architecture exhibitions. And so we did the first of three exhibitions that opened about 10 days ago. And um, in curating that show, I pulled together four projects. And what was important to me was to dispel a certain kind of a myth about experimentation <coughs> and digital technology. I think there's a misconception that software and hardware somehow was not in architecture and was discovered by young architects who, like monkeys at typewriters, started banging on these black boxes and having all kinds of happy accidents. Like, look at the form that that made for me. I'll, I'll pick that one. Um, and that wasn't my memory. And so I decided to kind of uh, try to state a few facts with these shows. And so I went back to the mid-1980s and picked four projects. Peter Eisenman's Biocentrum, Chuck Hoberman's Expanding Sphere and Iris Dome, uh, Shoei Yo's Odwara and Toyama Gymnasium, and Frank Gehry's Lewis House. <clears throat> and these are the first four of 25 projects we're selecting. And each one of them, for me, staked out a direction for digital technology. I think what was most interesting is in let's say, here's the first room, has one model and one drawing of each of the four projects. Um, I feel like I'm a, like some kind of a nerdy model or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, we should get this other way. Tell me what look do you want. Um, so, for me, these, um, these four projects staked out a direction uh, with Peter, it was very funny. He didn't even remember a computer being used on the project. And the reason why is because he was literally the computer. He was writing these notations of these figures in a sequence. And he was interested in using a computer to iterate all of these formal processes that he was previously doing by hand. And I know that because I worked for Peter at the time and I was drafting the drawings that the computer was making at Ohio State University, and I was like John Henry. This uh, There's a fable in, in the United States about a guy who pounds in railroad ties, and they make a machine that can lay railroad ties, and this guy races the machine over a mountain and beats the machine by a couple of railroad ties and then dies of a heart attack at the end. And that's really, for me, what digital technology did at this time. I remember we, or I, could draft faster than the computer could iterate, and it was a $15 million super Cray supercomputer, um, which had 256K of RAM. Uh, <laughs> and I remember I could just beat it, but I knew that that wouldn't last, and within a couple of years, desktop computers came out that could do everything much faster. But what was 
interesting about this time is Peter had a vision of what he wanted. He had an architectural ambition, and the computer was there because he had an intuition about what the computer could do. <coughs> and it was to work parametrically, to put in variables, execute those variables differentially, and then be able to procedurally go back and change a variable and run it again, and change a variable and run it again. And that's what Peter had been doing in his houses and all kinds of things, and so he saw it in the computer. Now that 1986 experiment ended up turning into a piece of software that a few people in the room have heard of called Form Z. So Peter was involved in the creation and definition of the tools needed in Form Z, which was a standard 3D modeling package. So, and it, he was, I think, 60, 59 or 60 at the time. So oldish guy at the height of his career with an intuition develops a standard computer software. It wasn't Hani Rashid and um, Jesse Reiser and I sitting up in the top floor of Columbia in the paperless studio. So in section there's also a stepping and a folding of these <coughs> curved elements. And in the elevations you can see the windows get pinched to a line. So there's one um, stainless steel reglet that connects everything up. And I spent, I, you don't realize it when you're doing this stuff, and then you see it. I, my dad retired when he was in his 30s and opened up a Dairy Queen. And that's the logo for a Dairy Queen. And I remember one of the things I did as a teenager was do all his ads in the newspaper for the Dairy Queen. So I drew these things like over and over again for like five years, these funny DQ logos. But so everything in the house pinches to a point and becomes flush with the surface. So in the living space, this is this luminous um, composite lantern, um, which is inexpensive tooling, lightweight. Um, I mean, one of the things we did is with the structural engineer, we told them how much the thing weighed, and they said, oh, well, all you really need is you know, custom welded T-sections to attach this thing to. And so for a certain point, we had like a steel frame that this thing would hang off of. And then I realized, like, why don't we just fold the surface into flanges and the flanges will stiffen the elements so we could just bolt the flanges together. I mean, start to treat the thing like a surface and a composite rather than treat it like cladding or treat it like a thing that needed structure. Um, we did, this was, it was the year the patent on Corian expired for DuPont. And so they gave us about a half a billion dollars of research. Um, to figure out how to form complex Corian surfaces because they wanted to show how even though you could buy Chinese Corian or European Corian because they couldn't patent, keep them from patent infringing on them, they wanted to show that DuPont had the technology to do things with it that their competitors didn't. So we just went crazy with Corian. I mean, we tried to figure out everywhere we could use it, we tried to use it. And there was a point where where we were picking out the poles for the cabinets, and I said, I don't want cabinet poles, I want to form it. So all, you know, the whole detailing of the house was all about getting rid of extra parts and having the surfaces do more work. So in the bathrooms as well, off-the-shelf Corian sinks and Corian electrical face elements all got absorbed into this monolithic surface and all of the cabinets and vanities and things got molded into these objects including the you know the furniture and the kitchen and the breakfast nook you know was all trying to eliminate as many parts as possible <clears throat> so the the composites have turned out to not only be um, you know, easily formable, but also ridiculously affordable. Um, and this is, we reclad these elements at Site Santa Fe. Um, every few years, they, for, for a strange reason, invite an <coughs> architect to do the interior exhibition design and an artist to do a recladding of the building. And so when they asked me to do the exhibition design, I said, well, why don't we reclad the building, but let's do it so you can just leave it. So we built these cowls, or these scoops, 
for all the major windows around the building. And then also did some interior elements which travel with the show. So there are four of these interior pieces that go from Santa Fe to Minneapolis and travel with the show. And then the exterior elements just live on the building for good. Um, but this was really because it seems ridiculous to be doing these um, you know, balloon frame elements for these museums that get trashed and thrown in the dumpster every time. So um, one of the things to just go through a few of the characteristics of these composites, one is that you can get this surface minimalism, that you can form them so they do more work than if you had to cut linear elements or cut panels. I think the other thing that's very interesting about them is that the geometry of the form has nothing to do with the structure and the construction. And one of the things I see among colleagues and students is that a form will be designed using a certain number of polygons or using certain number of curved loft profiles. And those lines, which previously, if you were drafting, would have been the lines of structure and dimension, <clears throat> end up turning into the structure. If you hang out with a person in the aerospace industry or the naval architecture industry who lives with composites, you find out the form is dictated by a certain set of interests, and the structure is totally arbitrary to the form. So here's an example of this kind of giant lantern I did with Bill Chrysler, where we wanted to do it in two materials, and we just built one form, which was the form of the lantern, and then we scribed an edge where we wanted to change from fiber-reinforced cement to fiber-reinforced polymer, and along those lines, we made these rings, these cylinders, and then just unfolded them and located these things, and they laid up polymer in this area and fiber-reinforced cement in those areas. And then once they were done, just popped everything together. But the, the material change in the form had nothing to do with each other. The form was continuous. The material change was designed arbitrary to structure. And I did the same thing with the Swarovski jewelry, where the line between polished metal and ceramic and stone, it's a monolithic object, but it has three different materials in it. And so everywhere where there was a, like say a mechanical element, which I didn't design these, they just buy the mechanical elements, we could integrate it into the metal continuously and then just break the shape arbitrarily. So instead of having to have a joint or a connection or a detail, we could make the details go away by breaking the geometry of construction with the geometry of the form. Um, and the clearest example of that is in the construction of these ultra lightweight sails where um, I started to get interested in boats because of the technology of construction. I mean, I sailed a lot as a kid, I mean, too much, and stopped, and then started to see what was going on. I saw Prada clothing ads where there were these background surfaces behind them, and it was the layout of these fiber toe paths of these sails they started making for the America's Cup. And I remember Renzo Piano, Frank Gehry, John Nouvelle, uh, all kinds of people, if you'd ask them, hey, have you seen that Prada ad with the sail? All the architects were noticing it, and it was because of the geometry. And the geometry is about molding a surface in what they call a flying shape, but that's the ideal shape for the sail. Then they analyze that with finite element analysis software to find out where structure needs to be, and then they draw the carbon fiber along the load paths of the structure so that the shape is one decision but then the location of the fibers 
is based on a structural analysis of that shape. It's not based on how you lofted the surface with isoparms. It's not made by the lineaments of a polygon model or a subdivision model. It's a completely arbitrary logic of structure to form. And so um, this, it's kind of inevitable this is going towards a boat. But the most uh, kind of clear example of that is a chair prototype that we designed, um, which we're now taking into a commercial piece of furniture, which uses this quality of um, structure and form being disparate. And we're using a material that's incredibly light and strong, and it's so light and strong that even though it's a textile, it holds a compression form. So. And I've, ever since I started working with Burrow Happel, they've always disliked the form of tension fabrics. Like, to me, they just look sad and saggy. You know, they hang. And so, and you don't get to determine what shape they are. You determine a frame, and then the, the fabric takes whatever shape the fabric wants to take. You can't give it a form. It determines a form. So, and that form finding has always been something I've not liked. So what we were able to do is make a rigidized fabric. So it's a fabric that is not tensile under its own weight. Um, and it's also the first thing that we ever did, which is what you call vacuum bagged pre-preg construction. So now my office has in it, um, you know, actually one of the few vacuum bagged pre-preg construction sites in California. Um, and what we do is we take this tape, and these are, they take standard carbon fiber toe and un unfurl it and flatten it so that all the fibers get parallel, and the white is a different kind of a fiber called Dyneema or Spectra. And they lay it down so thin that when you put your finger on it, you shred it. It's like incredibly lightweight to handle. And we lay those fibers in a path, load path, and put them on a mold, and the fibers already have glue on them that, that needs to be heated to be activated, and we put this uh, layup on a foam mold into an oven, and we put a, a vacuum bag on it, and put a pump on the vacuum bag to put pressure on all these fibers, and you cook it at maybe less than 120 degrees Celsius for about 45 minutes and you let it cool and then you get a, a shape which takes the shape of the mold that it was built on. So these chairs, we've had 800 pounds in them, but they weigh about six ounces. So it's for sure the lightest chair ever made that'll hold, you know, three adults in it. And it holds a compression shape under its own weight. So instead of being this kind of saggy fabric, it's a shell. But the minute you sit in the shell, you overcome the compression load and it turns back into a tensile fabric. So it goes from being a kind of rigid shell to a soft fabric um, continuously. So this kind of a form, you know, it's a, it's a fabric form that you can design. It's not a fabric form that designs itself by hanging. And we've done it in a few different materials. But to get this shape, you want to keep it light. So you tend to, you, you run analysis on it. And we've got 12 or 16 tapes at the points where it's highly loaded. And then we've got three tapes, which is the minimum for this to hold a shape where it doesn't have a very high load. And you just determine where you put those tapes and what orientation you put them in through analysis. You don't do it through the geometry of the form. <clears throat> And there's no, you know, I'm really hating metal more and more. I mean, there's no metallic points of attachment. The, the cables that hold it are 1.5 mil, and they're rated for 1,000 kilos, and they're just glued right into the layup. So when we set the things up, we put all the hardware in. It's all one sandwich. So it's a one-piece thing. Okay, so... The engineers that we've been working with for this stuff, 
are all engineers that do stuff that moves. They all do projectiles. And I'm thinking of Bernard Cashier when I use that term, because he, back in the late 80s, started talking about projectiles. Um, and it's leading towards moving building components. So this is a boat. I was working on a, an art pavilion for Tom Krenz in Abu Dhabi, which they keep saying it's still active, but it's crashed and burned for the time being. But they asked if I wanted to design two boats for them as a kind of consolation prize. So I started designing two boats for TDIC in Abu Dhabi and working with a local naval architect. And as we're working on them, we started talking about how I needed to design a boat for myself. And I got hooked into designing a boat and it became this high-performance, lightweight trimaran that's under construction now. And to make it um, to make it affordable, and also because I'm a gullible, nice person, I've pretty much adopted this naval architect, Fred Karubla, who's kind of full-time in the office now, but does a lot of the analysis for composites with us. He's an aerodynamicist and a structural engineer. And so Fred and I have designed this thing together, and the reason we can design it together is everything is designed with computational fluid dynamics in terms of verifying things. So. Fred designs a boat like any naval architect with experience and intuition, but the analysis they do on it is what verifies the performance. So everything has a formal consequence, but it's not necessarily rule-based. So I can throw things at Fred, he can temper them, or if we want, we can run them through CFD and see what they do and find out that they do things that neither one of us had anticipated. Um, the other thing is I said, well, I would just design the interiors because that's something that wasn't going to get me into trouble. So the inside of the boat is all designed ergonomically um, to be dynamic. And I'll talk about that in a second. So this is a first object. We, we called in all our favors and we had an experimental CFD company called CFD Max run a, a linked aero and hydro analysis of the boat. So they looked at both how it behaved in air and how it behaved in water coupled at the same time. And to do that, we had a 60 computer super array running for five days per run. So it took us half a year to do the CFD. Um, but it led to certain decisions about the hydro, the elements that go through the water. Um, it also is on what's called foils, which provide lift. So the whole boat, 80% of the boat lifts out of the water when you get going. Um, but if you put the foils in the wrong place, you get a bad kind of lift. So here's just an example, oops, of one of those CFD runs. So this was a week of 60 computers working on this, but you could see the boat is getting lifted in a bad way out of the water by that foil. But so we would run these things both on details like this as well as hull forms, and we would get back analysis like this, which red is detached flow. And so I, we could go back and redesign these surfaces to try to get rid of as much red as possible um, in the surfacing. <clears throat> the other thing is, you know, for five minutes I was working for Beneteau to do a new line of boats for them, and Philippe Stark had done that in the 80s, and they told me a story that had a big impact on me, which is when they talked to Stark, it's a French boat company, and Stark's obviously French, they said, look, we want you to redesign our whole series of boats, and he says, well, I don't sail, I don't know anything about boats. They said, it doesn't matter. He said, we really want you to focus on the interiors. And he said, okay. And they said, so let's get started. He said, well, first I'm going to need you to give me a boat. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. He said, I want it delivered to my garden in southern France for the summer, and I'll just live in it. And they said, okay. So they deliver him a boat. It's on the hard or whatever, dry. And he calls him back. He says, why is it standing up? And they said, well, that's how you store a boat. He says, well, I thought they were at an angle. And so they came back and they built a custom cradle for it that put it at a 20 degree angle. And then he lived in this heeled over boat 
for a whole summer. And I thought, you know, that's why the guy is successful. He's very smart. And if you talk to them, they'll tell you he designed the best interiors because he understands that you need to be able to stand up and rotate 20 degrees one way and rotate 20 degrees the other way. And everything you grab is set up to be grabbable at both the angle and vertical. And you kind of live on the sides as well as living on the ground. So it's a dynamic platform and it's a rolling, moving interior. So for the last year, um, on and off, I've spent time designing these surfaces. So instead of just sitting on a surface, the seats all have a little bit of a roll. So when it's at a 20 degree angle, you can still be comfortable on them. And all of the things you hold on to, and the whole thing is meant to be rolling around. And I offered, because we've been making this chair prototype, to just go ahead and build the hole inside, which was mostly because I knew the boat builders couldn't build what we wanted. So we cut tools, openings, and rebates where we inset materials like cork. Um, and because I had this naval architect in the office full time who knows about layup, he trained a couple of people in the office and we started laying up and manufacturing these components over eight weeks or so. And what you do is you lay these fabrics into the molds. You put a core, like a thin foam core, to separate the skins to give them stiffness everywhere. Then you put the whole thing in a bag and you vacuum it. And in that bag you put a breather cloth, which sucks up all the excess resin, which is just parasitic. You can see how that's working. And then you pop these parts off of the mold like this. So it's a, still a fabric and you trim it. And so this is a kitchen galley that weighs about three pounds. You know, we weigh and inventory everything and locate it in 3D space. Um, and so this is all the furniture set up in my office a few weeks ago, all finished. And there's a king size bed two single beds, uh, a kitchen galley, a seat, ten shelves, and a bathroom, which all, and, and steps, which all weighed together, weighs less than 40 kilos. So more or less a, a studio apartment that weighs 40 kilos in cord car, carbon vacuum construction. So it's insanely strong and light. And then, you know, this is when you paint them up, you know, they have a kind of auto finish quality because of the female molding of all the components. So anyway, this logic of construction, you know, that whole livable interior ends up being made out of about 10 or 12 parts that integrate all this stuff like, you know, locations for lighting and electronics and, you know, places to put your keys and your wallet when you get on the boat. And it's all molded into surfaces. So surfaces are doing all the work of what would have been different panels and parts and pieces and structural elements. Okay, so um, it's really not this linear, but designing this thing in the water that rolls around, um, I was asked by someone on the America's Cup uh, managing committee to style a new kind of a mark for them. And for the America's Cup, they have boats that are robots that they send out to make the course. And because the new boats go so fast, while the boats are all coming in one direction, they actually move the marks during the race. And they've never done that before. And so the race manager has an iPad, and he has six of these boats, and he just drags the boats so they're always headed into the wind and he hits go and the, the boats will all robotically move and then they stabilize themselves so they're not at an anchor. They have these thrusters that hold them in one place. But a robotic boat costs several million dollars. So they said, could we make marks which could position themselves? And a guy named Stan Honey worked out the positioning. Um, and they asked me to style the boats. <coughs> and while we were styling these marks, it came up it's pretty burned out, but the, the amount of boat 
uh, the amount of buoy that's in the water is only like 40 centimeters or something. And you can only push a 40 centimeter object through the water at one or two knots. So you have to throw these things in a boat, drive them to the course and throw them out of the boat, and then they can position themselves. And I said, well, if you would lay them down, so now they're about eight meters long or seven meters long, <coughs> you can make them go seven knots. So we designed these so that the battery pack that runs them sits down here when they're at rest and it drives up the length of the boat and flips it over so they can drive out to the course. So 12 of these things can go driving out to the course and then they pop themselves up and they hold their position and when you want to move them they flop over and drive. So this idea of a thing which rotates 90 degrees so that it can change its orientation relative to the ground was a little bit in my head. Okay, which brings me to what I would consider the fourth wave of digital technology, which is related to making things lightweight, which is that you can now start to think about moving building components and moving rooms, which is what we've been doing at the Angavanta for the last year. So again, it's the lightweight, it's this idea of ergonomic surfaces, so surfaces that can have multiple orientations. So you can design your floor to be a good floor, but you can also design your floor to be a good wall. And one surface can do both of those jobs. That was the idea I had. Um, and again, that you can uh, make this the structure, so you don't need a structure to move, you can do it with a shell, is also kind of important. So the first thing that had this idea to it was I was asked to compete against Zaha, Anish Kapoor, and I forget the fourth person, to do a pavilion for the London Olympics. And um, we obviously, we lost to Anish Kapoor. But so this is where Anish Kapoor's tower is. And I wanted to make it a robotic <coughs> dome. And this was in 2010. And so I asked Christian Moeller, who's an artist, but who's trained as an architect, if he wanted to collaborate on it. And we had the idea to do a gold dome that moved. And so Christian did a sketch where it had a kind of a nose. And so we made this gold dome with a pointer. And we gave it eyes, <laughs> and kind of apertures instead of an oculus. And the, the dome can rotate and point and track the crowds and it can also move up and down. And it, it sits on three columns, and on top of each one of those columns is a KUKA Titan industrial robot that can lift about 750 kilos. So we had to keep this dome down to the weight of a couple thousand kilos, which means a carbon fiber shell. So, and I think, where's the movie? That's the movie. So this is what we submitted. We didn't want a kind of frantically moving thing, so it's pretty subtle. So each one of those columns can move up and down, and the ring can also rotate. And you need an arm with at least three points of rotation so you can keep the dimension of the diameter of the ring constant as it moves. So uh, I wish I would have stuff of Christian's, but Christian has been doing a lot of stuff with industrial robots that track people in public space, like the if you've been to the Singapore airport, he's got a series of sculptures that follow you like propellers as you walk through the airport. Okay, so this was the first robotic building, and uh, I guess it was around this time last year, I was asked if I could design a 60 square meter residence uh, for today. And it was for a building festival in Cordrick called interior and 
I thought, well, it's impossible. You know, that's the size of a boat, pretty much. You couldn't have a family living in 60 square meters. But I, because of thinking about all this rotation, I thought, well, if you had a footprint of 60 square meters, and you could rotate a volume through 180 degrees, you could get 60 square meters to turn into 180 square meters. So you could intensively use all the surfaces of your house as living surfaces um, as a way of increasing area without increasing surface area. So we came up with this idea for uh, a shell, and the shell has columns in it which allow it to rotate, and so those are just circular rings and then developed this idea for a robotic base which could move the shell with belts and also rotate in a turntable way. Um, so you could hold an orientation in plan but change an orientation in section. And so these are drawings, they're pretty burned out, but you can see, for example, there's a kind of a uh, sleeping surface, let's say, not, not really a bedroom because it's a one room place. <laughs> But so there's a bed and a coffee table, and you can see the coffee table has a radius to it, and it's gimbaled so that it's held on an axis, and so it can spin, and when it spins, the stuff that's on the top of the table ends up inside the volume of, of its gimbal. So that's the dining room table with all the dining room stuff on it, but the underside of it is just a lantern, like in the Bloom House. So all the furniture is a lamp, so when you rotate your furniture around, it becomes the light source on the ceiling. So you don't look up at your stuff upside down, it disappears into the poche. And same thing with closet, is this kind of bean shape that travels around, so all your clothes don't get messed up when the house rolls around. So, and this isn't like for everybody. Like I don't see this as the future. I don't even see it as a house. Um, I mean, I, I, I've been saying too much what it's becoming, but it, it won't be a house, it'll be a conference room and a meeting room. Um, but it was really an experiment in thinking about a robotically moved room and how you would think about living on the different surfaces and not looking up at your ceiling and feeling like your stuff is upside down. So, and then this is the third position is vertical. Okay, so these are some views of a 3D printed version of it where you can see the furniture. So, you know, that's a light fixture which is a piece of furniture when it rotates in the other direction. Uh, these are the molds out in front of my office. We ended up just building everything. We built both the shell and we also built the robot um, just using the CNC stuff in the office. But, you know, this is also you know, a composite. This is just a kind of pre-packed composite panel. We've got it. This is it moving. And this is the, we videoed it and we stop motion animationed it. And this is why I think, I think architecture, if it's going to move, it should move in stop motion because it's clunky and looks like you'd expect a building to move. It doesn't move smoothly like a fly-through. moves like a heavier machine. And the next one is the smooth one. So this is a one-fifth scale prototype of something you, you know, could fit in. But the idea is, you know, that it's a little bit about the spectacle of the motion. So being like a hamster in a ball, I think, is definitely part of the excitement of having a room in your office space rolling around. Um, but it's also an idea about being intensive and using surfaces in ways that they uh, would otherwise not be used. And it's also about reimagining the volume that you design so that the ceiling isn't always just a ceiling. It's a ceiling plus something. So it, it's a way of bringing more constraints and more requirements to a surface so the surfaces can do more jobs than just being light emitting or just being decorative or just being ergonomic. Um, anyway, so so for me this kind of a, 
a rolling, moving architecture isn't really about the mechanics of movement. It's really about the dynamics of thinking through all the surfaces of a building more intensively with more stuff to do. So that's it. Thanks. Does anybody have a question? I got a lot. You have? Yeah. <laughs> to yourself? Yeah. <laughs> one. Give us one. <laughs> Is anybody awake? <laughs> they ask. I mean, they try. They ask. Anyone? I mean, it's kind of a friends and family event. I couldn't ask one. It's also Imro, it's a potato at last. <coughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yep, thanks.